front me? Yeah, sure. Be fine. Uh, yeah, now you, uh, b before we start, okay. you said you were, uh, you were uh, uh, interviewing pre-World War One veterans? No, we have done three World War One veterans. Oh, oh three, okay. Yes. World War One. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. They were in their hundreds. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. I was going to say, my God. Yes, <laughs> yes. Still around, huh? <laughs> oh, okay, geez, that's okay. this is an interview with Michael O'Shea. The Hampton Inn, Comac, New York. It is February 25th, uh, 2003, approximately 2.30 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Uh, could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? I'm Michael Francis O'Shea, uh, uh, born in New York City. And uh, uh, what, what else? When? Oh, October 5th, 1924. Okay. What was your educational background prior to military service? Oh, I was still in high school. Yeah, I, uh, in fact, I, I left high school in my, in my senior year to join the Air Force. Okay. Um, you were you enlisted then? Yes. Okay. Uh, why did you pick the Air Force? Well, uh, they, they came around to the, uh, one of our assemblies at high school. They were recruiting right in high school. And they uh, 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 promised uh, anybody who would fly that you'd get a commission and uh, you'd uh, make so much flying pay. And it was a very glamorous offer, you know. Mm -hmm. And I bid on it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, President Roosevelt at the time was going to build 50,000 planes. To, so he was going to have plenty of planes to, to, to fly and to man. And uh, I uh, actually, I guess it turned out that he... He must have been built ten times that number during the war, World War II. However, that was uh, that was the the interest I had in it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, before I was eighteen, I had a hell of a fight with my mother and father. They they wanted me to stay and finish school. And I said, "Geez, I want to join up before they they stopped enlisting, and, and I'll be drafted and I'll go into the infantry." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I uh, I finally broke them down and joined. Okay. Um I'm going to go backward a little bit. Uh, where were you, and what were you, was your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Oh, I guess I could, like every every American there was that I was incensed that the Japanese should have bombed us like that, and I was just wanted to seek revenge, you know. Uh -huh. to where were back. you when you heard this? Uh, I guess uh, at that particular time, I was with a friend of mine. Uh, and we were hanging around uh, his house, uh -huh. and his mother stuck her head out the window and says, Boys, she said, uh, they just bombed Pearl Harbor. That's over in Hawaii. And uh, they, they attacked all the American ships over there. The Japs did. So, uh, you know, it, it just took us off completely by, uh -huh. by off guard. Uh -huh. And uh, it was a complete surprise. Okay, when did you enter service? Uh, in, uh, as soon as I was 18, in uh, actually November of 1942. Okay. Could you tell us why you start with uh, your your basic training and tell us about that? Well, yes. Uh, um, we were uh, when when I first enlisted uh, in downtown New York, they put us on the enlisted reserve because they didn't have enough facilities for training. They were, the, our country was so caught off guard, we had no uh, pr preparation for war whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And uh, my God, they didn't even have uniforms for us. However, about two months later, they called me up. I was still in high school, so I, I left and uh, uh, we, we went down to Atlantic City. They had no training facilities for us, no, no places, no camps or anything else. and. Uh, uh, I was a part of the Army then. The, uh, the, the Air Force was a part of the Army Air Force at that time. And uh, they put us in hotels down there. In fact, we, they didn't even have uniforms for us. I went down there and I drilled uh, out of the hotels along the boardwalks in Atlantic City and uh, marching up and down and we're eating in, in their old big dining rooms there, our mess halls. And uh, uh, we, we still had our... Uh, civilian clothes, which uh, finally after two weeks they got enough uniforms for us and uh, I, I packed up my belongings and sent them back home. Mm -hmm. um, 
when did you uh, start taking specialized training? Uh, oh, that's, uh, it, it took a, a few months before they got organized and, and they mm -hmm. sent us to special schools, uh, uh, college training detachments and everything just to, 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 to start us on some sort of a routine. Mm -hmm. And then it took about uh, four or five months before they ever got us into classification centers. And they'd uh, classify you as a pilot, a navigator, a bombardier. And uh, uh, so we were sent down to Texas for that. But that was about uh, four or five months later. We were sent down to San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. That was a big training grounds then. By this time, uh, they were a little more organized and they got things going, you know. Mm -hmm. But for, for months, for oh, oh, a year, I guess, after the war started, there was very little training going on, uh, a very little uh, organizational training, you know, uh -huh. and uh, not like we have today. You know? uh -huh. we're, we're well prepared for war, we're prepared for all the things, you know, because we're internationally involved, uh -huh. but it wasn't then. Uh -huh. So you became, a, you went into, became, be trained as a navigator. Yes, what right. was some of the specialized training uh, you received for that? Well, <coughs> We, uh, well, we had the uh, special pre-flight school, and then uh, they sent us to advanced navigation school, uh, uh, which uh, lasted about five months. Mm -hmm. Where was that? Uh, down in uh, uh, San Marcos, Texas. And uh, they, uh, uh, they needed uh, quite a few navigators at the time. Apparently, they were short of navigators, so our whole class was uh, sent to navigator school. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of that time, uh, we were out night and day uh, uh, learning the different stars. And uh, uh, it was celestial navigation that we were concentrated mainly on. Uh -huh. For I'd say four of the five months, it was all navigational training and mostly all uh, navigating by stars, which uh, was uh, naturally you'd be staying up all night practically, you know, and uh -huh. sleeping in the daytime. Uh, when did you uh, join a crew? Yeah, that was after we finished uh, 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 advanced navigation and we were commissioned mm -hmm. as officers and uh, uh, we went to uh, 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 rotational training units, uh, reserve, oh, what were they call? I, I've forgotten the name actually, but uh, RTU. Any case, uh, it was sent out, we were sent out to West Texas at the time. It was a bleak place, desolate airfield out there. In fact, the place, place was called Rattlesnake Bomber Base. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they trained us. Uh, we got, a, we got a, tr a crew out there. Mm -hmm. The pilot, the bombardier, the navigator, the, the tail gunners, the, the, uh, the uh, ball turret gunner, the top turret, the engineer, radio operator, oh, the whole crew came together. Mm -hmm. Or ten of us, okay, well, and, and, and all, all the rest of the crews, of course, formed at that time. We got a uh, our first taste of what a B-17 was. Mm -hmm. That's the flying fortress. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when did you receive your first plane and, and go overseas? Well, we f first uh, received the brand new plane right off the line, just as we were about ready uh, to go overseas. This was about three months later. Mm -hmm. We had about three months training at this RTU. And uh, we, then when we were ready to go overseas, they, they flew in a, a bland, brand new plane. Just about every crew that was trained got a brand new plane. And uh, we, we took off from a place called Kearney, Nebraska, which was a, a sort of a center where the, the, the trained crews got their plane mm -hmm. and, and headed off overseas. Mm -hmm. And this was just an invasion time, too. There was a, an awful push on, I, I, as I look back at it now, which we didn't understand because well, we, this was just before the invasion and we were on our way then. And then uh, uh, the invasion started as we were going across to England. Mm -hmm. Could you describe your flight, uh, your different legs of your flight across? Yeah, well, we uh, started out, it was mainly navigation. I mean, incidentally, I hadn't had done any of that type of navigating before, you know, mm -hmm. and it was uh, my job just to direct the pilot to get, uh, to keep them on course, what have you. We flew across the country. We had never flown 
anything like that before. It was all training flights uh, around Texas and the states around Texas and out over the uh, Gulf of Mexico and, and even down into Texas, into Mexico itself. But uh, this time it was entirely different. We were given long hops from, uh, from Nebraska to uh, the east coast of the United States and then up to uh, Newfoundland and then across uh, one direct long hop back over to England. And uh, from, there, from there we were assigned to a bomb group. Mm -hmm. and what group were you assigned to? The 351st bomb group. That's okay. Triangle J. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, did you keep the same plane? Or no, <laughs> no. They pulled that plane away from us and they equipped that with special uh, equipment uh, just to, to outfit it for combat. In other words, the plane that was made in this, this, uh, in this country, the plane we got to fly across the ocean with, uh, was not, not the same plane that we ended up in combat with because they, they, they needed further work to do on it, you know, to prepare them for combat. Did you keep the same plane in all your missions? No, missions, no, uh, they, they'd switch you around. Whatever okay. plane that they could use you on, they'd, uh, they'd there, switch. Did you ever get a plane that you named? Yeah, oh yes, we did. We finally got uh, one of our own. Uh -huh. we, we named it, but we never never put a painting on it. Never painted no, it. What, no, what, what did you name it? Uh, it was 17 and misled. It was uh, supposedly a picture of a, of a 17 flying high and a naked young girl, 17 years old, looking looking up at her. Her name was L-E-D-D, M-I-S-S-L-E-D-D. -D. That's the 17 and Miss Led. That's two words there. Uh, but we never got the painting, though. It was just a, mm -hmm. just a name. <laughs> Did you ever decorate your jackets in any way? Yeah, oh yeah, sure. We uh, painted them and whatever. you. Yeah. Did you keep your jacket? Oh, sure. You have still it have it? Yeah. yeah. It's pretty well shut now, but uh, <laughs> my daughter loves to wear it. <laughs> um, did you keep your same crew together? Yeah, well, for most of the time we did fly mm -hmm. with the same crew. However, uh, when I was shot down, the, the two times I was shot down, I wasn't flying with my regular crew. You see, when they needed uh, a spare... Uh, parts, <laughs> boys, mm -hmm. bare men. Mm -hmm. They put one, uh, they take one man from another, well, one crew, put him in another when they needed them, you know. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I was, uh, the uh, both times when I was, uh, the unlucky times, I wasn't with my own crew. <laughs> I, uh, I, just, uh, <laughs> one of those unfortunate things. Did you have to bail out? Yeah, yeah, we shut down twice, both uh, by, both times by Fleck. So you were a member of the Caterpillar Club? Oh yes, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I'll show you on the, on the plaque I have, on the, the display case I have here. Um, how many missions did you, uh, were you on to I, the 20, first time uh, you were shot down? Well, the first time was 14. I was shot down on my 14th mission. Um, you want to describe some of your, what was your first mission like? Well, uh, it was a, that was a particularly scary one, I guess, if you want to put it that way. We had to abort the mission when we were deep in Germany and fly back by ourselves, no cover, no fighter protection, and uh, uh, from deep inside of Germany because we couldn't couldn't open the the wing tanks, which they were called Tokyo tanks. Mm -hmm. We were going to bomb Berlin. And our Tokyo tanks wouldn't open. <laughs> I don't know where they got these names from. I guess they were long distance. They called them Tokyo tanks. Anyway, uh, uh, on the way back, they, they, the engineer was working with it and, and got, it, got it going. However, we were far away from the formation on our way back home. Mm -hmm. So uh, coming back over Germany, that was a scary time. Because if we had been bounced by any German fighters, they could have shut us down easily, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a raw rookie crew and... Uh, uh, just breaking in like that. But we got back, so they could us. And uh, but that way, after that, uh, we got in the swing of things. You know, you you learn a lot from even your first mission. So uh, that was uh, in our case. That was what happened. Um, could you on any of your other missions? 
up to your 14th, were you ever hit by flak? Or oh yeah, yeah, flak was very common over Germany, mm -hmm. and they were very accurate, deadly accurate. They, don't forget, we used to fly over five miles high, mm -hmm. and they could pinpoint that flak uh, radar. Of course, they had a, a, a very accurate radar. Mm -hmm. And uh, Did you wear a flak jacket? Uh, yeah, yeah, we had the uh, uh, vests. Mm -hmm. Jackets and vests. Mm -hmm. Did you wear them? I did. Oh yeah. When I saw how accurate that flag was, I put it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, could you describe your 14th mission? Yeah, what, what was what? Your, your target? Uh, well, we were bombing uh, Munich, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a terrible uh, weather that day. We, we broke up the formation. We had to turn back, and we, even though we had most of the of the squadron. Uh, with us, uh, we we got a very bad flacking. Uh, once once it cleared up, uh, uh, the, we got out of the weather front. Uh, on the way back, we it, it, I I don't know if it made that clear. We were on our way to the target, but the weather front just broke us up. We couldn't uh -huh. see anything or anything, so uh, we turned back, and uh, uh, coming back, and, and then it cleared up again, and uh, the, uh, that's when the Flak guns hit us, and uh, and we got a very bad flacking, uh, which was uh, uh, it was a delayed flacking in the sense that uh, we thought we were okay. We were flying back, and we were halfway out over the North Sea, just about in the middle of the North Sea, when we had a sudden wing fire, and that was caused by the flacking we had, and probably a piece of shrapnel or anti aircraft. Uh, the the air, uh, artillery, air, the aircraft mm -hmm. artillery, got into uh, one of the uh, tanks, the wing tanks or something, and it exploded, and uh, the, the, the fire was deadly. And the pilot realized this, and he called bailout. So we bailed out. We were about uh, uh, two miles up, and uh, we, we, we bailed out. I had to break down the, the navigator hatch in the front there. And I was the first out, <clears throat> and uh, uh, on on the way out, uh, uh, I, I, on the way down, I counted all ten chutes, parachutes got out, and uh, uh, opened up safely. We had a long way to drift down so we could count them, but they, we were all spread out for miles. You could see them for miles away. The plane did explode finally. It, the, the pilot put it on automatic pilot before he left. And uh, before he bailed out, and uh, it did explode. So luckily, <clears throat> that saved saved our lives. And we we had continued flying with that plane with the wing on fire. It would have, you know, we might have all been killed. Uh -huh. So uh, and then uh, we we uh, just descended into the water, and we had some uh, training there while we were in England by a, a paratrooper who told us how to land, if you ever had to land on water, how to get rid of the chute and uh, and swim out from underneath it, because otherwise you'd, you'd come up underneath it and would drown you. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave us some good uh, tips on that, and uh, so that's how I, uh, I was able to, to get out, and, and most of the others did too. However, we lost two, two men missing, never found any remains of them, uh, and... Uh, uh, they were uh, apparently uh, drowned out there, and uh, and we've never heard anything. But uh, don't forget, that was about the, the closest land was 60 miles from the English coast. Mm -hmm. This is where I figured it was about 60 miles from the from the uh, the enemy coast and 60 miles from the English coast. So it's a uh, it's a long way for a, to get lost, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, How long were you in the water? Uh, about two, about three hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife was working all that time, and it was cold. Uh -huh. uh, luckily, this was about the middle of August, and uh, luckily the water is the warmest uh, at that time of the year. But the the, the, the temperature was 56 degrees, uh -huh. and that's pretty damn cold water. We yeah. were cold from and the well, time we... Who rescued you? Oh, uh, later on, well, we were finally rescued uh, by a... a, a, a P-47, uh, that's one of our own fighters, which was attached to the Air Sea Rescue Squadron of the Royal Air Force. 
Now they, they uh, used to fly out over the water if there were any, uh, any crews that went down. Well, our pilot didn't even get a chance to radio. It was such a, uh, such a hectic bailout, you know. Uh -huh. and, uh, but uh, uh, luckily uh, a P-51 uh, saw, saw us and circled around us. And they got a fix on him uh, from, from England. And they knew the crew was missing. One crew was missing. And uh, so uh, luckily uh, they had that much information about us. Otherwise we would have been completely lost. Uh -huh. And uh, But after, it was two hours and 50 minutes. And my, my watch was working all that time. And I, uh, uh, I suddenly heard a roar over the water. In the meantime, I had given up all hope. I didn't uh -huh. think there was any possibility of staying alive. I was so damn cold and uh, just treading water. And by this time, I was losing all my faculties of, uh, uh, um, uh, just to keep up my body heat. It was, uh, uh, it was, but you just had to do it. You just had to keep treading water. Uh -huh. And uh, that's all you could do. Well, all we had was a May West to keep us uh, up, you know. And we had a complete flying uniform underneath that. And uh, uh, if we didn't have the May West, I guess we would have sank. We had enough heavy clothes to drag us down. And uh, that might have been the reason the two who, who uh, didn't make it drowned. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> uh, we had, uh, we had uh, incidentally, we had nine men flying with us that day. Seven were rescued. But here's, here's the, the story of the rescue itself was this. These P-47s flew out, and, and, uh, and I heard this tremendous roar of the water, and it was, I, I just couldn't believe what had happened. And all of a sudden, I started, with every bit of strength that I had, to splash the water. And, and, and I listen to God, you, sometimes when you get a, a, a fear like that or a, a last-minute desire of, uh, I, I just, I must have put up such a terrible gush of water out of that, uh, out of that sea that uh, he spotted it, you know, and he, and he, and he turned and roared over to me and circled around me. I couldn't believe it that he, someone had seen me out of, don't forget, this is thousands and thousands of square miles of water, and, and there's only a, a little, a, a part of your head is sticking up, and that's all, and uh, <laughs> we saw the splashing, and, and flew around me and apparently called, uh, he was, must have been calling his, mm -hmm. his buddy, you know, at the time. <clears throat> and uh, he dropped a smoke bomb. And, oh my God, I was just uh, flabbergasted. I was here dead almost before that. And I just came alive and I couldn't believe it. But uh, he, uh, uh, he, uh, he then uh, kept continuing and then he dropped a, a, a dinghy. And, these were, and then I realized these were special air sea rescue planes that were equipped with this kind of stuff. You know, they were equipped uh, to to drop uh, smoke bombs and and dinghies to anybody that had to be rescued. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I uh, I had a hell of a job swimming to the dinghy. By this time, I was so exhausted, and he dropped it about a I'd say around, about a hundred yards away, and I, I started. And then and then incidentally before that. Uh, a buddy came, and there were two of them flying together. So he uh, he uh, he came over, and and when the first smoke bomb went out, he dropped his. Bu uh, the, the the buddy dropped his smoke bomb. Uh, uh, the first guy flew away. The second guy just continued to circle around me and dropped his smoke bomb. And uh, this was to 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 get some sort of a, a position, uh, the smoke rising from the water for the for the boats. Uh, air sea rescue boats. These were manned by the Royal Air Force, and uh, they uh, they used to patrol uh, all the North Sea and the English Channel, picking up crews like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, it was crews that were in dinghies, you know. And normally, when a when a plane would go down, uh, they'd crash land in the water, and they'd pancake, and uh, the crew would get out. Uh, from the uh, one of the top hatches, and and they had they had special uh, dinghies just uh, prepared, you know, and they'd inflate the dinghies and get in the dinghies. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, anybody that ever bailed out, there was no hope for them, you know. <laughs> and we were, I don't know how it was, but we were we were luckily uh, it was not our day to 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 go, and uh, they had. Uh, 
Well, they, 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 they spotted us, as I said. They dropped the thingy, and I, got, I finally got to the thingy, but I, 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 I inflated it, and I couldn't get in it. It was just, a, uh, it was just such a job, I just had to hold on. And I, I figured to myself, my God, if they don't come and rescue me in a few minutes, I'm going to have to let go and just sink. And it was only a few minutes later that oh. someone hollered behind me, and I, I could hardly hear them. Hey, get your hold of this. Hey, Yank. <laughs> and I, I, I looked around, and I couldn't believe this, the, the, the shadow in the water, with a boat coming towards me, you know. And it, and it was a guy standing on the prow of the boat and with a big rope in his hand. Catch a hold of the rope. <laughs> he, and and I, I, geez, it was fantasy, honest to God. And he pulled me around to the side of the boat, and uh, I uh, I couldn't get up. There, there was a, a rope ladder hanging on the side. I couldn't get up. I, there were, I had no strength in my body. So a couple of the crew members just stripped down and jumped in and grabbed me by the legs. And a couple of guys from the top of the up on, on the top of the boat just yanked me up onto the boat. And just I lay there in a lump. I couldn't couldn't move. And then they cut all my clothes off, all the flying clothes off me. I don't know what the hell kind of shears they had, but they cut everything off. And and then they started working me over with big heavy towels, you know. Mm -hmm. Apparently they've had this that experience before, and they knew what to do, you know. And these special rescue crews. And, uh, and then they 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 put me up, uh, got me up on my feet and moving around. See? And they just held me under the arms and and started walking and said move your feet move your legs and, and uh, it was uh, difficult to even think but and then it, it just uh, at that time I started shivering I don't know it's just a, a normal function of the body I guess and I was just shaking all over I couldn't even talk you know I was so uh, but uh, after all they got me down in the in the in the, sh in the ship, and they said, "How about some rum?" I said, "Yeah, yeah. <laughs> give me some." They gave me a great big drink of rum, and and, and, and uh, God, I, uh, I I didn't last very long after that because I hadn't eaten in about fourteen, fifteen hours, you know. And uh, boy, I went out. But that is the same uh, rescue unit uh, rescue your entire crew, or yes, they picked up. I I I, I was able to tell them that I was the f the first one out. And therefore, the rest of them should be in a line behind me. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went down and they picked up seven of the nine of us, including the pilot, uh, the co-pilot. We lost the we lost the radio operator and we lost the uh, uh, waste gunner. Uh, that was a, a thrilling experience, you know. And uh, later on, it uh, uh, gave me a. Uh, Qualifications for to join the Goldfish Club, which was anybody who was rescued at sea, rescued by uh, Royal Air Force Air Sea Rescue, who could be a member of the, the Goldfish. I'll show you. I'll show you that in the plaque later on. In the, um, were you uh, hospitalized after that, or no? No. Luckily, I was in pretty good shape then. You know, it wasn't. Uh, I, uh, I was able to get up and uh, get around. I, it was just an unfortunate experience, but I uh, pulled through it all, all right. As soon as I sobered up the following day, boy, I can remember uh, I had a terrible hangover the, the following morning. They brought us back to a base in England, and uh, God, they must have just thrown me on some sort of a bed there. I woke up the following day, didn't know anything about what had happened. I just completely forgot it. And uh, but the rest of the crew around there got around. I guess they. They also had some, some rum too, you know, they, so that we all reminisced on what had happened. We were very sorry about the two that we lost, though. Mm -hmm. um, what was the next mission uh, that you, did you go out on a mission right away after that? Or well, they gave us uh, two weeks, uh, what they call flak leave, and uh, we, sent, we were sent to a, a, a rest home which they call the flak homes. And uh, for want of a better terminology, yeah, we, I hated it. Because, uh, most of the guys that had gone, uh, went there were guys that had finished their missions and were on their way home. But I knew I did I, uh, only half finished mine, and I had to go back and, and fly the rest of them, you know. So, uh, but we had two weeks leave, and then went back. 
Okay, so you went with your regular crew then? Yes, I went with my regular crew after that, until the second time I was shot down. What yeah. mission was that? That was the, the 24th mission. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where were most of your other missions uh, besides your 14th and 24th? What were some of your targets? Well, we bombed everything from Berlin uh, to... Uh, uh, incidentally, we bombed, we were briefed to bomb industrial targets. You know, when I say Berlin and the biggest cities, mm -hmm. we didn't bomb indiscriminately. At least we didn't think we were bombing mm -hmm. indiscriminately. You know, dropping bombs, coming over the city and dropping bombs on the civilian population. That, that wouldn't sit well with any one of us, you know. And uh, we were never briefed for anything like that. What we were briefed for was industrial targets. Now, some of these targets were around large uh, populated areas, you know, and you had to go get them. And I'm sure, hey, today, uh, a war today is going to be the same way. If we hit uh, big targets, uh, industrial targets around Baghdad, say, there's going to be a lot of civilian population that will be hurt. In a, but the, we don't set out to do that. Specific, at least that we didn't do it back then. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they don't do it now. You know, they, they, they go out to, uh, to destroy the industrial targets, the, war, the, the targets with war potential, you know. Was your plane equipped with a uh, bomb site? Oh, sure, sure. So we you always, were a lead bomber? Uh, my, uh, well, I was with the, I was, uh, uh, towards the end of my missions, I was always flying lead plane, because I had the exp experience, you know, and I was flying with a lead bombardier. So he'd always have the bomb site. But some of the, uh, the planes at back, even though they might have the bomb site in them, they didn't use them because we bombed all at once. We bombed on the lead plane uh -huh. to keep a pattern of bombing, you know. Uh -huh. um, do you want to describe your 24th mission? Yeah, I was <laughs> over Germany then. It was the second biggest synthetic oil refinery in Germany. Polis was the name of the, the target. And uh, that day we lost 40 planes. And of all kinds, that is. Not only B-17s, B-24s. We lost a lot of fighters and everything else that day. It was a, it was a terrible, rough mission. It was clear weather and everything, uh, uh, so that it was a, an ideal situation. Uh, it was a maximum effort mission. We must have had well over a thousand planes bombing. They not only bombed the Polits, but other big oil refineries the same day. But Polits was the big target. And uh, uh, this day, I didn't find this out until much later, the Germans finally perfected their radar so that they could pick up on our radar. And this was the first time they had ever used this over this uh, mission to Polis. And uh, uh, the, well, we, we had radar in our lead planes. Uh, well, they called it Mickey. It was for uh, picking up uh, targets if there was a cloudy day. You could pick up a city, or you could pick up a coastline with the radar we had then, with this, these Mickey sets. They were a, a, uh, something which the British developed, I believe, and uh, we refined it in our planes. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, the British needed it because at bombing at night, uh, they had to have some sort of a good identification system for navigating, you know. Otherwise you'd never find the, the targets. Everything was so black over Germany. There were no lights naturally. And uh, uh, we developed it, even though we bombed in the daytime, for, uh, for bad weather bombing. But anyway, this, these Mickey sets were radar sets, and they send out a, a, a radar impulse, you know. And the Germans found out how to pick that up and to use it to their advantage, so that they could home in on our formations much more accurately than they could before. God knows they had plenty of accuracy before, mm -hmm. and uh, they could just pinpoint our position, you know. And that's why the, the flak was so deadly accurate, at the, especially at the end of the war. And <clears throat> they picked us up. They, uh, we, we lost seven of our 12 planes that day, of our squadron. Three of us were shot down in Germany itself. Four others were lucky enough to get to Sweden. They were badly uh, uh, damaged. And they landed in Sweden, but they couldn't get back to, to England. <clears throat> so they were interned 
in Sweden. But the three of us, three bomb crews that went down over Germany, all, we were all, almost all captured. And uh, most of the crews got out. And uh, Were you hit by flak? A flak, it was flak again, yes. Mm -hmm. Both times it was flak. Uh, we had fighter attacks while, uh, during the, all the time we were flying, but the, the main uh, enemy, you might say, the main uh, cause of our losses at the end of the war was due to flak. At the beginning of the war, it was due mainly to uh, fighter fighters, German fighters. Um, did the entire crew get out of, of the yeah, plane? The second time, the entire crew got out. To my knowledge, I've only um, met a few of them since, but uh, uh, we, we kept in touch with one another. As I say, this wasn't my regular crew. If it was my regular crew, we'd be much closer, you know. But we still did keep in touch with one another, and, and I've gone to their places. They've come to my my house here in Long Island. We've had uh, different get-togethers, you know. Mm -hmm. We have uh, our group reunions every year, and uh, we get together there, yeah, some, mm -hmm. some of us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you bailed out? Were you injured at all on this? Uh, yeah, I hurt my back when I bailed out the second time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I came down over a little town. And I was barely lucky enough to slip my chute enough to, to get away from a, a couple of the buildings that were very close together. But I landed on a, on a fence running in between and uh, hurt my back very badly. But I wouldn't let the Germans uh, know. I, I didn't lay down. I got up on my feet and, and uh, they were surrounding me. The people don't, they could see me coming down. It was a perfectly clear day, just like sort of like today, you know. So you were and, captured by civilians? Uh, no, no, they were they were uh, uh, there was a, a German policeman there, and uh, and there was also some sort of a, a militia of some sort. Mm -hmm. They had the the guns <laughs> pointing at me when I I got down, but luckily I held my hands straight out to show them that I had no weapons. I wasn't going to make any kind of a uh, an offense there that I was not a, a paratrooper, you might say. Uh -huh. Did you ever hear any stories uh, about civilians uh, killing oh, yeah. airmen? Oh yeah, that was very prevalent. They uh, even uh, in the far suburbs of uh, not the, you know far away from the big cities, uh, these people were so uh, uh, brainwashed with the propaganda that was put out by Goebbels at the time that we were terror flyers. Turflinger was the name. There's a German expression, and, and Luftgangster. Uh, 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 that uh, they were frightened of us, I guess, so much so, and they, and uh, we were doing so much damage to Germany that they would they would come after you and kill you. There were so many of our, our flyers were pitchforked to death mm -hmm. by uh, uh, by farmers with pitchforks, uh, especially if they were wounded and laying on the ground, you know. They'd come after them, and however, I, I I would suspect that was a minority. I I I don't want to paint any broad brush that was all you know terrible German catastrophes, and and, and they were uh, as I said brainwashed by the propaganda, that, uh, the Nazi propaganda. After you were captured by the uh, German police and militia, what did they do with you? Uh, well, they they, they kind of rounded up the rest of the crew. And, uh, and they, they shipped us off uh, one place after another until they, they had us pretty well focused. Uh, and, uh, and then they, uh, that evening, they sent us to a military camp that was a few miles away. And uh, some of the crude uh, vehicles that they had then, my God, they, uh, I guess we had horse and wagons and uh, uh, also they had these charcoal burning trucks, which they put us on, and buses too. They didn't have the fuel then, believe it or not. We found out how effective our bombing was because they had lost all their fuel. Mm -hmm. Not like in this country, you know, we have so much fuel. It's unbelievable. You wouldn't think of not being able to go to a gas station on a corner and filling up for anything you wanted, you know, whether it was a uh, a, a lawnmower or, or, a, or a, a little 
boat for the, you, you know, uh, uh, for anything at all. You could always get gasoline. Well, they had nothing then. Okay. And they when went, was this that you shot down? Uh, October. October uh, uh, 7th, 1944. Mm -hmm. About seven and a half months before the end of the war. Mm -hmm. um, did, what kind of camp did you end up in? Well, uh, it was uh, Stalagluf Three was the name. And, uh, b before that, we were we were rounded up and sent uh, on onto the, the 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 first interrogation camp, which was on the other side of Germany, and we were taking these uh, old boxcars and, and trains and and uh, through Germany, and and especially we went through Berlin, and we saw the destruction of Berlin at that time, which was a shambles. Even then, this was long before the Russians ever came anywhere near it. Mm -hmm. And due to the bombing, you know, the Royal Air Force was especially bombing it, especially at night, you know, that was one of their big targets. And then later on in the war, the American Air Force started bombing. And uh, the, the destruction was terrible. Not only to the railroad stations, but as far as I could see, you know, as we uh, rode along in the railroad cars. But they, anyway, they took us down to the, the, the interrogation center, and they kept me in solitary for t about 12 days. And boy, that was a uh, hell of an experience, too. Bread and water, <coughs> starving us practically. And uh, they, they call you out about every third day and uh, interrogate you. And they wanted you to fill out a form. Now, we were told, naturally, to, uh, all you had to do if you were ever captured was to give name, rank, and serial number. And so, consequently, we've been good soldiers. Uh, well, I can only speak for myself. Uh, that's all I gave them, name, rank, and serial number. But I, uh, this so-called officer who could speak wonderful English, he was a major, a more Luftwaffe major. Uh, he said, well, now, uh, he said, Lieutenant, please, uh, you've got to fill out the rest of these ten simple questions, just asking uh, a few simple things about your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, where you live in, uh, in, uh, in America, and a uh, uh, few simple things like that. And I says, I said, Major, you know I can't do this. I can only give you my name, rank, and serial number. And he kind of pleaded with me in a soft his voice. He was so <laughs> the kindest looking guy you ever saw in your life. But I knew he was a cutthroat behind all his facade. But he'd offer me a cigarette. And uh, I didn't smoke, but I said, no, thank you. And uh, in any case, things like that. But three times I was called out. Three times he pleaded with me to just to fill out the ten questions. And we'll send you off to the permanent camp. And I said, I'm sorry, Major. That's all I'll fill out is my name, rank, and serial number, and you won't get anything. And he says, we know a lot more about you. He says, than you possibly can imagine. And we, uh, we, pro we know probably everything that you can tell us there. Just fill it out for the sake of the Red Cross. And I said, I'm sorry, all I can give you is the name rank. Well, anyway, they threw me back in solitary. So I had 12 days of solitary, and it was killing me. I swear, I can remember going. This was a room about four feet wide, about eight feet long, and about uh, seven feet high, you know. And it was nothing but a, a, a slab, padded and everything else. Uh, it was a, a, just a pit. And uh, nothing but a few slices of bread there uh, for, for, to eat, you know, and, uh, and, and some little barley soup. And uh, th th this was the purpose, the purpose was just to, to get you to fill out the, the forms and uh, just to fill out the, about the ten questions that they asked. And they had all kinds of means. I, I remember one time when I went in there, I guess it was the second or the third time when I was being interrogated. The Major said to me, well, he says, now why don't you fill this out? Be sensible. He says, your pilot filled it out. And he says, he's on his way to the permanent camp, but you're sitting here in solitary. All you have to do is fill it out, and, and you'll go too. And he, then he showed me the pilot's form. And uh, he must have uh, figured it was my regular pilot. I knew enough about him to know where, where he came from. He was from California, and uh, he had some uh, other things that were listed down there. 
And I, I looked at it and read it, and I, I still said, no, no, Major, I can't fill this out. I don't care what anybody else did. I just, I'm just i going to give you my name, rank, and serial number. Well, I, found, I, I thought to myself later on, how could the pilot do that? You know, how could he uh, betray his own cause by doing But they had enough information about him that they could fill this out and pretend that he did it, see? And uh, this is the way to break us, break us down. They had ways of doing it without the torturers. But they even had to torture while we were in the solitary control. They had a heater in this lousy little thing, uh, uh, and it was October. It was, you know, a mild, time, mild uh, uh, time of the year, but they, put, they turned a the heater on at night so that you'd just fry in there. They'd get the temperature up to about 120 degrees, it seemed like to me. I, I know when I, when I do this, I take all my my clothes off, whatever clothes I had, and just lay flat there on this on this board that they had inside the cell, and uh, finally they turned it off. But that was a, a, a kind of a, a hidden torture, mm -hmm. you know. If anybody came around to inspect it, they'd take and say, "Oh, that's just a heater to keep these uh, prisoners warm," you know. If any, if there were any uh, uh, international Red Cross which did come around to inspect the prison camps, you know. This is all according to Geneva Convention. But they had ways of torturing, and they did torture us. So by this, this heat method. And, uh, but uh, in, in, but uh, in any case, after, after about 12 days I, of, of solitary confinement, they finally let me know that uh, I could finally go. And uh, I, we were sent to the permanent camp then, you know. And uh, we was uh, done a long trip across Germany to the east of Germany, uh, to Stalag Roof III. Uh, and uh, that was the permanent camp. And uh, that was another railroad ride, of course, crowded in these dingy, uh, uh, it wasn't a boxcar, it was a, some sort of an old railroad train that they kept us in, you know. Well, it was a hectic, lousy trip. Still hungry. Uh, we had very, very poor food, naturally. Whatever they gave us, I can't remember now, but it was very, uh, nothing like we had when we were flying out of England. When you were in Luft 3, did the food improve any, or...? No, we got Red Cross parcels then, uh -huh. but it was much better than what we had uh, uh, during the interrogation camp, you know. That was, that was uh, they call that the, the interrogation camp Dulag Luft. The other was the Stalag Luft, if it makes any sense to you. And, um, did you uh, use your cigarette, did you receive the cigarettes in your Red Cross package? Oh yeah, yeah. Did you use them for trade since you didn't smoke? Yeah, I didn't smoke them, but I gave them away, you know. You, you didn't trade, use them as no, barter? No, I, I didn't have a chance to very much, I just uh, gave them away. But at the, at the very end, I did was able to get a few, and uh, the only times I was ever able to use them was when we, we finally uh, uh, we evacuated our camp. We were in uh, the camp there for, for uh, over three months at Stalagruf III, and that's the time the Russians started their advance on the Eastern Front. And they were crushing Germany from the east, you know, mm -hmm. as we were putting the squeeze on them from the left, you know from uh, Normandy and northern France and, and Rhineland, uh, uh, the, 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 the Russians were coming all the way through the eastern part of Russia, or the western part of Russia, I should say, through Poland and the Low Countries and, uh, and into Germany from the east. And they, we had uh, Germany in a vice then. Uh, they could see that they were, if they were sensible at all, they could see that the the war was being lost for them. There was no way to defend against them. And uh, anyway, the, the Russians started their advance, but the, and they, they would overwhel over, overwhelm our camp if they, they just kept. The, but uh, Hitler gave the order that we would be evacuated, and uh, we had thousands of flyers in this camp. We must have had uh, uh, damn near ten thousand, maybe at least eight thousand. Anyway, I, I don't know the exact figure. And then we, we, were, we had to evacuate the camp and, and march across Germany in a bitter winter. One time we reached 29 below zero, I heard. Now, I didn't have a chance to check 
and how often I've wondered is how accurate that was. But that, anyway, that's so cool. And the, the day we evacuated our camp, uh, it, w it was a, a bitter blizzard, and it was terrible because none of us were equipped for anything like this. And uh, boy, we started marching across Germany day and night and day and night, you know. And uh, we, we lasted the, the blizzard, and there were so many guys that fell in there. And it was guys that even died on, on, the, on this uh, trip. And they'd uh, pick up the, uh, the sick ones and throw them in, in, in uh, uh, carts, horse-drawn carts, you know. It, it was a, such a disgusting trip, I, I, I couldn't even, it took me a long time to describe it, you know. But, but the, uh, the order was that to get these flyers and keep them all together, don't let them be recaptured by the Russians. <clears throat> Frankly, we didn't have any much use for the Russians. I think we would have just, uh, just as preferred to be, to be uh, uh, remain prisoners of the Germans than be recaptured by the Russians. So, but uh, we didn't have the choice anyway. So uh, uh, we marched, and, and uh, uh, we had some terrible experiences on the way. But they finally uh, got us into a place, a little uh, south of Berlin, and they got us into boxcars. And uh, they crowd us into, the, into these boxcars, 50 or 55 men, into a tiny boxcar. Now, uh, their boxcars were about one quarter the size of an American boxcar. Now, you, you have some idea of what an American boxcar is. But because their, their tracks were narrower and the boxcars smaller, they, uh, they crowded these men in. And they'd, uh, on top of that, they'd ha have to have a guard in there with us. And uh, so uh, uh, we just uh, took turns and just uh, standing up or crouching down in the closest possible way and uh, inside the, uh, the boxcars. And uh, it was, it was hell hellish. We, we, there were so many of us were sick. We, uh, all of us had a diarrhea or dysentery and, uh, and uh, no means. They'd lock the, lock the, the car doors, jam them shut before they took off, and uh, it was miserable in there, you know. Um, just, Did you receive any medical treatment at all? No, no, not, nothing up until that time. Even even uh, when I did, I did complain after I was shot down. Even before we ever got to the interrogation camp, this was the day, uh, uh, the day I was sh uh, shot down, late that night. I, uh, uh, somebody came around who could speak English. One of the guards in the, in the, 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 the military facility where we were at, and uh, he says, oh, "Are you hurt?" He says, a, "A doctor will come and look at you." So I did. I, I said, "I hurt my back. I, I landed on my back on a picket fence, and I, I uh, uh, well, uh, he says, uh, take your clothes off, and the doctor will see you." And I waited around there. And it, it was a cold night. Even though it was in October, uh, I, I, uh, 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 I waited for the doctor. He finally came around, and uh, he, uh, he's bent over. You know, uh, well he had his uh, he could he couldn't speak English. The the, the one who the interpreter said told me bend over, and he just looked at my back. He only did was rub his hand on my back, and turn around and walked out. That was the entire medical help I got from Germany. They didn't give a damn whether my back was broken or anything else. Now, I don't uh, say that's terrible, I, you know, but they, had, they, they had their own men to look after, and I, I will say they, they must have fulfilled a, some sort of a Geneva Convention protocol by, by doing that, but uh, that's, that's, uh, that shows you how crude things were during the war. So, uh, but uh, anyway, did I answer that? When, yes. When you got into the boxcars in Berlin, where did you go from there? Oh, uh, yes, we, uh, uh, we, after the boxcars, we, we ended up down in, uh, uh, just outside of Munich, uh, at, uh, oh, I beg your pardon, just outside of Nuremberg, Nuremberg, right. and uh, we got out, and uh, and they marched us to a camp that was uh, the most desolate looking place we've ever seen in our lives. It was uh, uh, formerly occupied by Italians, we could see that by the stuff that they uh, uh, the 
the newspaper clippings and things like that that were in the buildings that we were crowded into, these little huts, and uh, it, uh, uh, they were, um, uh, these poor Italians actually, they, they were rounded up by the Germans when, when Italy surrendered, and they were treated, I guess, even more miserably than we were. I, I really felt sorry for them, and what they, they must have cleared them out and gave us their places. What they ever did to them, I don't know, but uh, it was miserable. And that's the first time we came across fleas and lice was in this camp. It was miserable. And uh, uh, then we had we had these uh, little, uh, what would you call them, uh, fleas, lice crawling all over us. Uh, what is the word? Uh, I can't think of it. But anyway, uh, uh, it was... Uh, uh, I guess uh, within a couple of weeks, though, they got DDT, which I never heard of before. A can, little cans of DDT they, they brought into us, and they were, uh, it was, uh, it must have been American-made stuff that came in through with the Red Cross parcels. And we sprayed this on us, and unfortunately was able to control some of the lice and the, and the fleas. But uh, <clears throat> that uh, it was a very, a very... Uh, unfortunate uh, experience there in this uh, Nuremberg, and during that time we were bombed, not only by the Royal Air Force, but by our own American Air Force. They had no idea where this camp location was, and when they first, uh, when we first got there, the Germans naturally didn't uh, notify them. We were bombed, uh, and boy, I'll tell you, that's a frightening experience, uh, uh, being bombed, especially by your own planes. Uh, heavy bombs dropping all around the camp. Thank goodness uh, they didn't hit directly on the camp. But uh, uh, they, uh, a few were killed. A few uh, of our own uh, flyers were killed. But uh, generally, and they were away from the camp at the time. But uh, in the camp itself, it wasn't uh, located. About, uh, I guess about a half month later, we had again had bombings by our own Air Force and by the Royal Air Force. The Royal Air Force bombed at night, we bombed in the daytime. And um, I guess we had about four bombings altogether. And uh, a terrible experience. We, we dug, we dug uh, trenches there. The Germans allowed us to dig trenches. Finally got shovels into us. We, we used to go out and, and try to dig trenches with, uh, with the ordinary uh, can, uh, little cans that we had, that we like uh, milk cans and uh, and uh, corned beef cans. You know that we did uh, that we'd get a Red Cross. We came in the Red Cross parcels uh, to dig trenches six feet deep. You know, into the ground. So it showed you how desperate we were to to do something to get away from the bombing. And uh, uh, the Germans finally gave us some shovels to shovel with, and, uh, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a terrible experience to be bombed by, uh, by your own, especially by your own Air Force. Later on, though, uh, I will say uh, the second time we were bombed, we were uh, second and third and fourth time, I guess, uh, they did have our position. Uh, we could see whatever they bombed, especially when the Royal Air Force bombed, they'd send out a line of flares. And the planes always bombed on the other side of the flares, away from the camp. You know, so to, uh, we, we avoided, uh, uh, you know, they didn't hit us. And, uh, so. um, okay. How long were you in that camp? Uh, we stayed there for about two months. And then, uh, then there were the, we, we were on the Western Front. Then we didn't know exactly the position we were at. However, this was where the uh, General Patton and his Third Army were, were moving on towards Nuremberg. And uh, then, of course, the Germans uh, evacuated us then, a second, another a second time. And we started on a march from there down towards Munich, which is farther south and away from uh, where the front was. On the way down here, we had a, a little better time than the first time. The weather was better. It was in April of the following year, and uh, we had uh, uh, 
even though we were uh, very poor conditions, all the time we were in Nuremberg, we had a very uh, bad uh, uh, cond uh, conditions, of course, but uh, uh, we had no food then. And we didn't get any Red Cross supplies or anything. We were eating the whatever the Germans gave us, which we call Black Death and Green Death, the, 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 the soup and the, the whatever it was, you know. And, and the potatoes were all rotten, mangy. They they send in cheese every once in a while, which was which was moldy, and and uh, as moldy as could be, as they just grimy. But we were so hungry, we'd eat just about anything at that time. The the, the soup they would send in would had the bugs floating all around in it. We'd eat the bugs. <laughs> we kid ourselves. Well, this is our source of protein, and uh, uh, it's a joke now. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. uh, when you when you're hungry like that too, you you will just about eat anything. <clears throat> Thank goodness we didn't, nobody had to come to cannibalism or anything like that, but... Uh, Let me stop you right there because we've got to change, change tapes. tapes. Oh, sh okay. uh, after you left, uh, you marched toward Munich. You were telling me about you marched right. to Munich. Yeah. And the weather got better. It was uh, it was so much better than uh, the, the the last march we had in a bitter winter, you know. But uh, and we were able to uh, we got some Red Cross parcels coming through on the trains then, and finally being delivered to us. We were able to uh, I can remember the little bit of coffee I had and the cigarettes that I had. I I trade uh, with the civilians. I remember I picked up a, a nice dagger one time from a German civilian. <laughs> on, the, a, on the road. There's a POW. And a POW, POW, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, if the German, uh, if, the, if the guards knew I had, I had it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I was looking for a, a knife, you know. And uh, this was a, 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 a beautiful little dagger. And uh, the guy pulled it out of his little sack. He was riding a bicycle. He was a businessman. And riding a bicycle, and uh, he pulled it out of his sack, and he gave me it just for about ten cigarettes. He was so happy to get those cigarettes. <laughs> I was happy to get the knife. So it was an even barter as far as I was concerned. And uh, uh, we we bought a, what, a coffee, <coughs> our coffee, our powdered coffee, which we couldn't use much of anyway. But uh, in any case, we uh, the Germans were, had no coffee. They had this ersatz mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, we'd get uh, bread, potatoes, and things like that, just enough to stay alive on the march. We marched for about two weeks, I'd say. I can't, I can't remember the exact day. And it was down to Bavaria, which was a nicer part of Germany. And it was uh, a springtime, early spring, and everything was nice and green then. And uh, we finally got to the, uh, the, the final camp. By, by in the meantime, the Americans, as well as the British, found out <clears throat> that they were transporting, transporting thousands of, of POWs on the roads. And of course, uh, our planes, uh, uh, the flying men, especially the fighter planes, were all equipped to, to strafe. And they'd strafe anything, any column of, of soldiers, you know. And, and they'd, they'd strafed a lot of American POWs as well as British POWs, whoever was in the line of march. But uh, they, they got the understanding that these were POWs. In fact, one time uh, we were on a march and, and uh, I grabbed a, a big armful of hay and I ran out into the middle of the field and wrote P, PW with the hay mm -hmm. on the field itself so that if uh, the planes flying over would see that this might be a POW column, and and uh, and recognize that we were uh, we were Americans, you know, uh, <clears throat> and uh, not to shoot, because they were strafing anything they could. And I remember after I had done that, that uh, a P-51 came by, and he rocked his wings as much as to say he he understood. <clears throat> so then uh, uh, they they got the message out to the Germans not to move any more POWs. Get them off the roads. By this time, we had uh, the, the war was coming to an end, and the Germans uh, 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 listened 
to uh, whatever they, they could. That's all they, whether they sent radio uh, messages to Germany uh, or whether they, they, in pamphlets which they dropped. Do not march any more POWs on the roads. Get them off the roads. Get them in the camps and keep them there. Do not move them. And uh, it saved a lot of lives, I'm sure. And I have, a, I have a, uh, one of those uh, forms at home. In fact, I might have it in, in that booklet there, if you care to look at it later on. Show, uh, telling the Germans, in German, and printed in German. And it was signed by, uh, by Winston Churchill, and apparently uh, it must have been Joe Stalin, and, uh, and, and the, new, the new president of the United States, who we didn't even know, that was Harry Truman. Uh, we, we knew that Roosevelt died. In fact, we, were, uh, we, we showed him our great respect. We all lined up uh, to, to the chagrin of the Germans who wouldn't allow it. We stood at, at solemn attention, uh, uh, I guess the day after we heard that Roosevelt died. And just in honor of Roosevelt, you know. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you heard this? Well, we were pretty saddened, of guy, I, I guess. Uh, you know, we were hoping that uh, he'd be around to the end of the war. Mm -hmm. But we, it was, by this time, the war was coming to an end, and it wasn't going to stop the momentum of of, of, our, of the Allied forces crushing Germany, you know. And uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, what uh, it. Uh, uh, well, anyway, I don't know. I lost the gist of what I wanted to tell you. However. Uh, 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 this is this is uh, we we respected uh, Roosevelt mm -hmm. and uh, was hoping you know he was our leader and no matter what politics anybody might have had at the time before that he was uh, he was our leader at the time and you know most of us were so damn young especially the flyers we were all young guys you know mm -hmm. hell when I was shot down it was just uh, two days after my twentieth birthday and uh, guys well, we had guys and they were still teenagers you know. And uh, everybody was very young. They had no f political uh, feelings at the time, like you have when you get older. But uh, in any case, uh, everybody was sorry about Roosevelt dying. How were you liberated? Uh, General Patton's Third Army came on, and uh, it was uh, it, 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 he sent out a, a, two divisions at the time: one armor division, one infantry division, just to liberate our camp. Well, we had thousands. At the end of the war, we had uh, thousands, and this was well over 10,000 at our camp, finally liberated in a, pl a place called Mooseburg, uh, Stalag 7, or 7A maybe it was. And uh, uh, it, was, it was a concentration place for all the, uh, I shouldn't say concentration, it sounds like a concentration camp, although that's just exactly what it was. Uh, but it was uh, they they got all the uh, all the Americans and the British and and all other allies who were POWs mostly all flyers they got them all together you know in one camp towards the end of the war and uh, they wouldn't move them after that especially after they were notified not to move any more POWs on the roads but this is where we, uh, Patton came in and the Air Force of course came in and. And they shot the place up. They killed a lot of Germans, uh, making the last this ditch stand there. I understand they killed about 50 Germans. These were fanatical ones who were still willing to fight and to hold on to whatever was left of Germany. <coughs> they were either SS or Gestapo. And uh, they, uh, it was foolish. Who were most of your guards at this time? <clears throat> oh, they, well, mostly old men. Oh yeah, the, the, if they were young at all, they'd be fighting on the front lines. They'd be fighting with some military unit. Uh -huh. the, the guards were the old, poor old guys. I remember in some of the marches that we went on, we'd have to hold the, the guards up, you know, and carry them along. They were all men, and we'd carry their rifles. We'd sling them over our shoulders. And uh, our, our intention actually was to stay together. Uh -huh. You know, and we felt so sorry for them, you know, because they were in a worse situation than we were. They might have been eating a little better than us, but they, uh, they still had no, uh, uh, the, the conditions were terrible for all the people, you know. Were any atrocities committed against any of your fellow soldiers that you know of? 
You know, uh, they they didn't uh, they didn't abuse us, any of the guards or anybody like that. They didn't, uh, not overtly. Now we might have had atrocities against us in ways that we weren't aware of, you know, but they respected us as we would respect uh, them if they were captured, you know. You know what we Americans were completely followed the. Any Geneva Conventions, as far as POWs were concerned, we did a wonderful job taking care of theirs. Mm -hmm. But then we had things good in this country. We had no reason not to follow the uh, everything right down to a T, you know, uh, follow the rules. The Germans at the time, <coughs> they had just about nothing at the end of the war. They lost everything. They couldn't even feed themselves. So naturally, they're not going to bend over backwards to feed us. With, you know, we were all mostly flyers that were destroying their country and uh, uh, they they couldn't really get much sympathy for us but they didn't hate us or anything like that so but I will say that they had no overt mm -hmm. atrocities against us <clears throat> so um, where did you need any uh, medical treatment after you left <clears throat> oh yeah yes when I uh, came back uh, we, we were finally we were liberated by General Patton. He came around the following day to our camp and you saw gave, Patton oh yeah, yeah. And he uh, he was quite a distance away from me, but you could hear him. He had kind of a squeaky voice, you know. I was surprised. He, he had nothing like George C. Scott who <laughs> who took his part, you know. He uh, but he was a tough old guy and he he was <laughs> he was vulgar. Oh, geez, he did some of the things he'd say, and he didn't give a damn who was around. And uh, he just, uh, uh, what he thought of the Germans, he thought they were worse than dirt, and uh, killed all sorts of bitches. And, oh, he, he, could, uh, he could curse something fierce. Did you hear <laughs> any stories about Patton shooting any Germans or anything no, like that? No, I never heard that, uh, personally shooting anybody, no. Okay. Uh, but then I didn't find, uh, know much about Patton, you know, mm -hmm. except that he, he liberated us, you know, and I'll always be fond of, uh, of our liberator for that, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's hard to say anything bad about him, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if that makes any sense. <laughs> but uh, he was a rough customer. I know he used to, just about every river that they'd, ca they'd capture all the way through France and Germany, He'd have to give everybody a personal display of uh, of pissing it, you know. And he he'd say, "Here, I'm, and he, 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 everybody took pictures of him while he was doing it, you know." I'm sure that these pictures never got back to the general public back in America here, but uh, uh, the, everybody would laugh like hell. And he was uh, well, he was that uh, he was a vulgar guy, but he uh, he was uh, don't forget he was a high-ranking officer, so. They respected him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, I guess after you left there, you, we were talking about your medical treatment. Oh yeah. Well, after that, we were we were still confined to that lousy camp. They tried to keep us together, confined there. It was like the Americans uh, took over where the Germans left off, and uh, they but they tried to keep us together so that if eventually uh, they could evacuate us, they'd want to evacuate us all at once. Uh -huh. But we used to take off. We we cut the we cut the wire, and and get out and, and get into the towns and whatever. By this time we got a little few more Red Cross parcels. And Patton, when he took over the town nearby, he uh, he took over the bakery and he started making bread, white bread. You know, the, 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 any of the German bread that we had was like a like a brick. And it, it, honest to God, you could use the things for bricks themselves. They were they're the hardest. Uh, they used to make it even with 10% uh, sawdust, yeah. and now this was for bulk apparently during the war. Things were so bad over there that they used these these conditions, and uh, naturally the bread was not wrapped or anything like that. They were just baked in ovens, and and they came out and uh, and and uh, we, not only did we, if we were lucky enough to get any bread, not only did we eat it, but the German people themselves ate this. Mm -hmm. When Patton came in, he took over the bakeries and and, and he brought in, uh, uh, I guess, carloads of uh, white flour. <laughs> we had uh, white white bread for the first time in in, uh, in my case about eight months, and uh, it was uh, it tasted like cake almost, you know. 
But uh, uh, I, uh, <coughs> when we finally got back, they <coughs> they shipped us all back. About two weeks later, they were able to get enough planes. They flew it, flew them into a nearby airfield, and they evacuated us by trucks to this airfield, and we flew back to a Camp Lucky Strike, which was in northern France, and it was uh, the big uh, POE embarkation camp, you know. And they, by this time, they deloused us. They took all, they, we took all our uniforms and burned them. Uh, whatever we had, the flying clothes that we were shot down with. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we completely deloused, got chances for good clean showers and, and cleaned up, you know, got uniforms, all enlisted uniforms, but they were good good clothes, once again, clean uniforms. And they had a, some of the other, they had good food, naturally. On the way back, though, uh, I, I knew there was something wrong with me, and uh, but I, I didn't want to say anything at that moment. Uh, I wanted to get back to the, to the country, back to the States as soon as possible. They told us they were going to get us out. As soon as they could get a ship for us, they'd take us back to America. So I didn't want to do anything to disturb that. You know, I didn't want to call, I didn't want to go to sick call or anything. But on the, on the way back, uh, I, uh, I was... Uh, 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 put on a, aboard a big ship, and uh, uh, I guess I was only out of three or four days. I complained. I uh, went to the, the to the doctor. We had a, a doctor aboard the ship. They had sick call there, and in the morning, I guess I I went to one day and I told him I was sick. He examined me. He says you have some sort of a, a virus pneumonia. So uh, he says you're going to go into sick bay here. They put me aboard this, it was a big liner, an ocean liner, that they had taken over and used as a troop ship. It was called the John, John Ericsson. It was uh, from the Norwegian line. They used to use it for a liner running back and forth between Norway, I guess, and uh, America before the war. And anyway, <coughs> uh, there was nurses there and everything else, and, and they, they, they couldn't diagnose anything there at the time. And, uh, but they, they put me aboard the, the, the ship, and I was pretty damn sick at the time. And all the, all the war, I, I seemed to be all right. It's only when I, I started eating well once again that uh, things then turned bad against me. I began to realize how sick I was. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, anyway, they, they took me off on a, on a stretcher and when I got back to the States. It took the, the trip took two weeks coming back. It was a slow convoy. And it was still in darkness at night, you know, they keep the dark out, because the U-boats were still operating. And they naturally, they'd sink any ships. And uh, so we, we went under cover of darkness completely. And uh, we got back into New York. I was taken off the ship, and uh, uh, whoever else was uh, uh, in the sick bay, taken up to Camp Shanks Hospital. That was a port of embarkation. Debarkation, I guess, at this time, uh, for uh, uh, anybody who was sick. They had a, a special hospital up there. They kept me there for a month, and they diagnosed my trouble as tuberculosis. So I had, to, <coughs> I had tuberculosis on my home or right side at the time. And looking back, I, we weren't even aware of it at the time. But we were tr uh, our little cell was thrown in. Uh, this was at Stalagluf 3, thrown in with a guy who had tuberculosis very badly. And it spread. You know, the conditions were terrible there. We were hungry all the time. And uh, that's how I got it. And uh, it took them a, a month to diagnose the, t the TB at the time because they, they didn't, I guess they had primitive ways then. In fact, they, what they did was to aspirate some of the fluid that I had in my uh, chest around the pleura. Uh, around the lung, and they injected it into a guinea pig, and it killed the guinea pig, and they were able, they were able, able to tell what the, what the cause of it was, that it was to break it. They sent me from there, Camp Shanks, which is upstate New York. Now, maybe it's uh, some, where some of you people come from. I don't know. Uh, did, did you ever hear of Camp Shanks? I've heard of it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure where. It must be. Uh, I, I gather it was somewhere up around West Point. Yes. Was, yeah. Yes. You're right. And, uh, Only on, uh, yes, on, on the west, on the side, west of the river, yes. side of the river. West side of the river, yeah. It was a big camp then, 
uh, even before, uh, uh, before uh, port of embarkation and also debarkation for all uh, 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 troops coming back from Europe, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, uh, I guess there were other big camps there too, but uh, Camp Shanks was one of the ones in New York. So anyway, uh, they sent me there by by train, by hospital train, out to Fitzsimmons General Hospital, which was a, a known tubercular uh, uh, hospital, a general hospital uh, for the Army. It was an Army hospital out in Denver, Colorado. At that time, they used to send uh, tuberculars out to out to the Rocky Mountains, you know, and Denver was one of the big ones. And as far as the Army was concerned, they had this Fitzsimmons General Hospital. And I was out there for a whole year recuperating from the TB. And I was finally retired from the Air Force as a first lieutenant uh, with, with tuberculosis. But after that, I came back and I wasn't out of the woods by any means. They sent me back to, uh, and, and I was assigned then afterwards to the Veterans Administration because I was out of the military completely then. And uh, I, spent, uh, I spent five years altogether and most of that time in body casts because the, the tuberculosis had spread throughout my body and, and nobody was aware of it until long after it happened, you know. It spread throughout my, uh, my body into my spine and they call this Pott's disease. Now it's, it's a, a disease today that's almost unheard of because healthy people don't get uh, uh, tuberculosis anymore, you know. You hear it coming from the third world countries yeah. in the world. But however, a, a, a very few Americans have it uh, who uh, have lived normal lives and ha eat healthy diets and what have you. But uh, <clears throat> it uh, unfortunately had a grip on me and uh, it kept me hospitalized for many years. And I had, during those, uh, all those years that I was hospitalized in the Veterans Administration, uh, I was, uh, I had five major operations on my spine for tuberculosis and uh, <clears throat> this was before they came out with any kind of a cure for TB which happened about uh, 1950 or 1951 they came out with some what they call a miracle drug for TB streptomycin it was uh, one of the antibiotics which was famous at the time they tried it on us we were the guinea pigs of course and uh, I was glad to get it because it, it uh, did the cure on me. Able, I was able to get up out of <clears throat> the hospital, start walking around. Most of that time I was hospitalized, I was in a body cast from my knees all the way up to my neck. And uh, uh, it would be one body cast after another, you know, in all, that, uh, in all those years. So it was uh, a trying time. Uh, I was in a veterans hospital mainly in uh, uh, the Bronx VA Hospital, which is still there, uh, on, on Kingsbridge Road. We used to call it Base 81. I don't know what they call it now. I've been back there. It's not one of my fond memories to go back to that hospital. But uh, I spent so many years there, from 1947 to 1951. And most of that time, as I said, in a body cast. Uh, TB really hit me pretty hard, you know. Then I was able to get out and walk around and, and once again start walking, which took months to, once again, to almost, you had to learn to walk again, you know. And you know, luckily I was still young and, and uh, could, could do it. I had no ties. I wasn't married or anything. My mother, God bless her, she used to come over to visit me practically every day in the hospital. It was a terrible trip across New York to, to get out to, to see me. But uh, uh, I, I was able to get out, and, uh, and, and then I, they, they gave me a, a back brace, uh, a brace which fitted around my life, much like a flag suit, I guess. But uh, I was able to just improve. It took several months. They sent me up to uh, Camp McGregor. I don't know if that's up around... I don't know if it's still around. It's a place where uh, General Grant died. It's a, it's, yeah. a, it's a state prison now. Is it right? Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. Well, it was a, lot, a nice so camp, then. That. Yeah. That that was. I That's right. That, that was a camp. Yeah. Not the, up there, Glens Falls? Glens Falls, Falls, between Saratoga and Glens Falls. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had more of a chance to get around and see that part of the country then. I got around to see a little bit of it, but mm -hmm. and it was a nice part. But uh, I was up there, recuperating up there. And then, finally, and then, I, and then I was able to get into the college. I went out to Did the West Coast. Did you use the GI Bill? Yeah, it was the Public Law 16 mm -hmm. for disabled veterans. I went out to the West Coast. I graduated from <clears throat> San Jose State College about 1955. It was about 10 years after the war was over, you know, and uh, I came back here to the, to uh, New York and uh, worked at different jobs around New York. And uh, Do you ever join any veterans organizations? Oh, yes, I joined. You know, at, at one time or another, I joined almost every one of them, you know, mm -hmm. but now the only one I'm really active in is the POW groups. Well, there's a nucleus, a camaraderie amongst ex POWs, which is so much closer than. Uh, you never joined the Eighth Air Force. Uh, oh yeah, yes, okay. I I belong to that also. I'm yeah. an Eighth Air Force group. Uh, uh, yeah. All of you guys belong to that. <laughs> Pardon me. All of you guys belong to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're worse than Marines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we I, I very often my wife and I go down, uh, almost every year, in fact. To our reunions of the, mm -hmm. to our bomb group, mm -hmm. the 8th Air Force. Do you stay in contact with any of your crew? Oh yeah, yep. They yeah. still, most of them are all dead now. I only mm -hmm. have two left yeah. of my original mm -hmm. crew. Yeah. And then the pilot that I was shot down with, uh, he uh, he's still living. He's out in California. So uh, I did, it, the few of us that are still alive, we still maintain a contact. You know. Mm -hmm. We've got some uh, memorabilia. Oh, yes, we to oh, you, you wanted to do that on, on tape. Oh, you want to show it? Uh, yes. You want me to show it? Okay, uh -oh. listen, you want, you, you, I can pull those things off. I just All put right. that, that tape on there, uh, right. but I can, I can get that off in a hurry. Uh, put it, uh, if you want to, I just... Oh, I guess there's a little bit of a mark there, but... Uh, I'm a, a little afraid that I, by shoving it in the, car, in the back of the car, that it might break. <laughs> so, uh, this is on my wall at home, so. Uh, uh, Maybe you can focus yeah, on that while he's doing that. Okay. Yeah, incidentally, my sister, God bless her, she was wonderful. She. Got, made this album for me, and she asked me if it was to take care of it. And I, I never kept it up to date. I just, just threw things in there. I think we know who the guy is on the front. When was that taken? That was during my time in England. That was an, taken by an English photographer. When I, that was just after I was shot down the first time over the North Sea. And uh, I went to this little photography store somewhere in England, and I said, geez, I'd like to get a picture taken so I can send back to my mother. One of the best pictures I ever had taken, honest to God. He, yes, he, he respected me for it. And that was about the only good picture I ever, take, I ever took during the war. I didn't get very many pictures taken at all. So, uh, uh, at least I have that one to show. Should have, should have had more sense, I guess. Well, point. no, that I, I don't blame you for not wanting to have anything happen. A little afraid, yeah. Because I was only cautious, though. Okay, you can leave these on there. Okay. All right. Do you want to ex explain to us what uh, each and, and every item is? Okay, well, uh, should I uh, start off with the medals? Uh, I'll start with the Purple Heart. Okay. The air medal. This was the uh, this is the victory medal, and this was the POW medal for ex POWs. This was a French medal given a Normandy. If you participated in the Normandy campaign uh, from the time of the invasion right uh, through the end of the campaign, this was a French medal. Very lovely medal. Uh -huh. Very colorful one. 
And uh, I don't know if very many uh, Americans know the, the ones who did work, the, who did participate. But however, it came out very late. It's only been out about five or six years, apparently. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had to be living to, to get it. They also had a citation, which I have in this book here. I'll show it to you. Mm -hmm. And this here was the, the European Theater Ribbon. And I have five, uh, five uh, battle stars for that. This is the American Theater Ribbon. And, and this here is the New York State. Mm -hmm. uh, they call that the conspicuous service. Yes. I guess you're familiar yes. with that. Right. Yes. yes. And these are some of the patches that I wore during uh, my time in the service. This is the Air Force, the General Air Force patch. And this was the 8th Air Force, the big 8th Air Force patch, the Mighty 8th from, from England. This was an aviation cadet patch when we were training as cadets. This is the patch that we wore on our sleeve. Then. And this was something I picked up after, so I was retired as a first lieutenant from the Air Force. Now uh, what is this? Oh, that's, that was my bomb squadron that mm -hmm. I was in. It was called the Ball Squadron because of the, of, of, of the original <coughs> commander was named Ball. <coughs> and uh, everybody mm -hmm. called it the Ball Squadron. And they got the, the, the baseball as sort of the motto. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that was with the 8th Air Force? 8th Air Force okay. over in England with the 351st Bomb Group, yes. And uh, the, the, that was, the Ball Squadron was the 511th Bomb Squadron, if you just to make it technical. This was the patch that we wore on our, uh, on our uh, shoulder, uh, on our, usually on our flying jackets. Uh, the Triangle J was also the, 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 the painted on the tail of the B-17. The dorsal fin of the B-17 had the Triangle J on it. Every, every group had a different letter and a different de designation, whether it was a, a triangle or a square or a circle mm -hmm. on the back. That's the way they... They marked them. And uh, tell us about your, there's your goldfish club. Oh yes, the, the goldfish club. That was, uh, if you were rescued by Air Force, uh, Air Sea Rescue of the Royal Air Force, you were entitled to a membership in the goldfish club. So I still get information from them. <laughs> and I still write them. They're over in England. Hmm. And uh, it's a very active act organization over there. There's this caterpillar club. Yeah. And... Okay, and that's for uh, anybody what, that bailed out, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. If you were bailed out, if you bailed out in, under emergency conditions, uh, it's not, see, a, a, a regular paratrooper wouldn't be uh -huh, entitled. Right. It would have to be an emergency condition that you bailed out. And I did it twice there. And incidentally, this is the, the, this is the German dog tag we wore. The Germans gave us this when we were captured, you know. And uh, I don't know if uh, all POWs got it, but they, we did in the Air Force, you know. We had to wear that thing, too. If we escaped or anything, we'd have to have that with us. We recaptured again. Uh, at least they, they know we were POWs. We tried to get uh, ditch it and throw it away, uh, uh, and, and we were recaptured. We could be shot as, as, uh, as spies. Uh, uh -huh. So we wore that along with our regular uh, dog tag. And this is a this little gadget here, <laughs> the wings I had, uh, I made made that uh, in the prison camp. There was supposed to be a ball and chain there. This was one of the things we used to, uh, to, to uh, kill, kill time, you know, in the prison camp. Incidentally, as officers or as sergeants, which everybody was who was shot down, they were either one or the other. They 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 couldn't work under the Geneva Con Convention. An officer could not work. A sergeant, well, he could work if he if he volunteered for it, uh -huh. and none of them did naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, uh, consequently, we had free time. You know, the, the, the Germans did not; uh, they followed that convention that way. They could uh, they could work all the poor Russians, uh, <laughs> kill them if they wanted to, and they did. But they uh, they respected us in that respect. Now, is that your military ID card down there in the left? Yeah, the that's right. Yeah. That's what I had uh, uh, during the war. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, Issued from the War Department. Now they call it Department of Defense. Did you get everything? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll open this up and I'll, I'll run through some of the things that might be here. My sister did such a wonderful job oh, making this, this album. Uh, and it's several years old now, of course, but it's uh, 
Yeah. Maybe it'd be better to hold it up oh, against sure. here. I think. Yeah. I have such a lot of junk in here, I don't know whether it's worthwhile showing everything, you know, but uh, I, there are some things in here that could be very interesting to you, I'm sure. The picture's taken at when I first... Well, who is... Oh, when I first went in the Army. And uh, these are <laughs> these pictures that you take in a little machine. And, All those uh, pictures are you? Yeah, I guess they are. <laughs> and a friend of mine here in this one. I know that's all. And uh, just to, to send home, uh, and I am surprised they <coughs> kept some of these things. And while we were training, we were training, uh, we went, uh, uh, when we first got our uniforms, we were sent up to, to uh, Syracuse, New York, to Syracuse University. And uh, I don't know if you know anything about Syracuse. Mm -hmm. That building is still there. And, uh, but in any case, uh, it's, it's developed quite a bit since then, you know. But it was uh, still a going university then. And uh, it's a college training de detachment. They, before they sent us uh, on to, to, uh, uh, down to Texas. And these uh, different buildings around the campus of Syracuse, and that's one of the papers they had there. My name was mentioned in there, so my, and my sister kept all this stuff together. And, and we, we even had flight training while we were up there. Uh, they wanted to see if we could take the, the training. And uh, but while the time, or during the time we were there, they had a, a terrible wind storm there and destroyed all the planes. Hmm. And I, I sent that picture back. These are some of my family. Uh, taken, I, I lived in New York City at the time on the outskirts of the Bronx, and uh, this is my mother, well, my mother and father, and this is the, my sister. Both my mother and father are dead. My sister's still alive, and uh, she still looks after me. Because <laughs> for her, I wouldn't have any kind of an album at all. You know, she kept all these things together for me. And this is the first. Uh, I only had one leave, and all, all the time before before I got. Uh, uh, before I was sent uh, uh, overseas, and I was able to come home. This is before I went to uh, to cadet training. I was still, uh, you know, that's, uh, I, was, I guess I came back from Syracuse University then. And these are some of the letters that were published then. Let me see if I can, I went down to San Antonio, Texas for uh, cadet training then. And uh, here are some of the pictures taken. Uh, now that was, this was taken, Afterwards, because I, I'd already got the commission in, somebody drew a picture over in Mexico, and <laughs> but uh, these are just pictures taken of uh, of training periods and and in the airfields and what have you, and, and some of them are mixed up; they're not quite in order. Now that's that same picture again, uh, and uh, let me see if I have anything here that might be of interest. Is that your graduating class? Yes, that's right. The, the flying school class, yeah. Now, yeah, whereabouts are you? Uh, right here. Yep, that's, uh, and they all signed it, you know. I wonder how many of them are still alive today. I don't think very many. But, uh, and I wonder how many had the same experiences that I did. And incidentally, this, this is the, that uh, French citation that we got. This is one of their uh, recognitions. You know, we speak so badly of the French today, but they, they, they did recognize and they, they did thank us veterans for what we did, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a, a letter of thanks from the Council General in New York there. <clears throat> And this was the remains of the crew. This was done, oh, I'd say five or six years ago. Yeah. And some of the guys... In 1990. Yeah, I guess... Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, ten years ago, I guess. That's me here. And this is some of my tail gunners dead. This guy's still alive. I, I, I think these two are still the only ones alive. The, the others are dead. So, uh, I... I, uh, I don't know... <laughs> that's all... And that's all that was remains of the crew 
of, uh, of the original crew. This was a shot down crew. We were captured. And this was the award of the Purple Heart. I joined this retired officers organization many, many years ago. Here's a picture of my original bomber crew that was uh, taken down in Texas back in 1944, just before we left for overseas. This was early 1944. Now where are you in this one? That's me down here. Uh, this is the pilot, the co-pilot. Navigator, bombardier, and these are the rest of the crew. Now, it's the engineer. He had a, a, a very serious accident inside the plane while we were in, in training. Almost blew his leg off, but he uh, came out of it all right. He's still living today, by the way. And these, I think all the rest of them are dead. Every one of them. Yeah. Here's a picture that was just taken recently, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, I don't know if you can get it very clearly, but that's Miss America there. She came out to our, uh, to the uh, Veterans uh, uh, Cemetery out here, uh, Long Island National uh, Cemetery at Calverton. You might have heard of it. It's, the, it's going to be the biggest, if it isn't already, the biggest okay, cemetery. And uh, while well, she was there, she, this was Miss America, and she came out. Her theme of that year was helping disabled veterans. Ah. So she... I don't know if there's anything else I have here. I get graduation. Okay. Well, you have this in here. Yeah. Okay. Here's a. Here's a. One time when I was in a veterans hospital, they took us. They used to take us down, and they showed us wonderful times. And uh, uh, they had a big VFW meeting one time down in. Uh, I guess it was Madison Square Garden. And they got the veterans uh, around to the, 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 those of us that were uh, in, in body cast like I was, and uh, the, the show was a good time. And they had these big uh, performances down there, and we were the kind of like the hosts. Bob Hope was one of the wow. original performers, oh, and I, I got his signature there, you know, along with Jerry Colonna. Do you remember? Oh yes, yeah, yes, I remember. The two of them were the buddy buddy, and uh, he he wrote I don't know where. Where, but, but I have his, his signature there too, Jerry Colonna. And, oh yeah, here, Jerry Colonna, yeah. And uh, some of the other uh, people along there, they had all the Congressional Medal of Honor winners there, and uh, I got their signatures too. But Bob Hope, you know, I mean, he's such a big name. I wonder how many people have his signature, you know. So it was nice uh, to get that. I don't know what, what, what some of these things are, to tell you the truth. I haven't looked at him in some time. Oh, here's a, this is graduation class of, of high school. I won't bother with that. And uh, certificate, uh, diplomas, what have you. But uh, Now, who are those people in that photo there? This one here? Yeah. Oh, this is a, another, another grad, when I finished flying school, we uh, had a, a kind of a big beer session, you know. And uh, they... Uh, at that time, they didn't allow uh, uh, any much beer on on a, on a post on the post. Uh -huh. But they they break down every now and then and allow it for something like a graduation. So no, we had a, a beer bus. That was all. <laughs> where about to you? Uh, gee, I don't know if I'm in this picture. No, no I, I don't believe I'm in this picture. Uh, but uh, all of these guys around me are my buddies. And this was my instructor navigator at the time. He was a second lieutenant, and he they were we were in training. These, the officers here were the instructors. We were all cadets at the time, just graduating from flying school. Mm -hmm. So, now is that you there? Yeah, that's me. As a cadet. As a cadet, right? That was taken down in San Antonio. This uh, particular thing on the, on the cap was for cadet cadet training, you know. Okay. And I have other pictures here. Now this was taken out at. Uh, in the western part of Texas. He was my, the bombardier, and we were 
we used to have, go on flight training there. Oh, this was taken many years later, and when I was in a hospital in Denver, Colorado, uh, well over a year later. And these were down in Texas, at Austin, Texas. That's the capital of Texas now. You might have seen that picture. Uh, you see it quite a bit now in the, from Bush. When it, that's the Capitol building there. There's an archway underneath there, which you see, with windows in the background. You can't see it too well there, but that, anyway, that's where we were. Well, we used to go there on open post. We'd go to, uh, this was, this was uh, the, the training as, uh, as pilot, navigator, and bombardier, you know. That's a uh, bombardier, uh, pilot, uh, navigator wings, and the pilot wings there. This was uh, different things that my sister has together, which we didn't get in order. But, uh, I mean, it, it, some of the things are mixed up here, but uh, they're all pictures taken at different times. This was taken down in the Alamo, where we used to go when we were down in uh, an open post. Uh, during the war, we didn't get much of a chance to get out on, 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 on a pass on a weekend. You didn't just go out on a, on a Friday night and stay out all week. There, there was very little chance of that, especially in cadet training. We had to... Uh, uh, my God, we go for eight or nine weeks without even going out or off the post. So some of the guys, when they did get out, they'd raise hell. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I use your, your gentleman? Oh, okay. Excuse me. Go ahead. All together. This is leave in New York City, March 1944. Okay, we got the shot of that. Yeah. That crew. Looks like a drawing that he made <laughs> of this plane. Okay. okay. Now there was uh, there was a picture going back a page or two. It looked like it might have been an ID card when he was a POW. Just uh, yeah, that oh, that picture is. right there. Or is that a passport photo? Passport photo. Okay. All right. that he's a, a POW. This is uh, my mother, my sister and my mother at that time was out in California and they used to attend any of these prison of war meetings that the Red Cross would hold all around the country to inform any uh, of the next of kin mm -hmm. about their, uh, anyone who was, might have been held as a prisoner of war. So they had these meetings, they had these publications and my mother, uh, my sister kept these things. Well, I mean, this, this uh, was uh, one of the letters or, or postcards I wrote uh, when I was a POW. Incidentally, uh, th this, this brown paper behind here was uh, originally from the first album we had. My sister says, my God, that's a disgusting thing. So she got the second album for me. and uh, But I, uh, I guess I didn't keep it any better than I did the first. 
<laughs> but this was a, a yeah. I was gonna say, don't try to yeah, pull it out yeah, because, because it may rip. And yeah. it's it's so faint. I don't think the camera will pick. Okay, okay. Pick it up anyway. Yeah. Well, anyway, they they kept the letters. You know, in all my time, eight months in a in a POW camp, uh, I'd send letters out. I, I think they only allowed us three letters a month, and they had special forms to write the things on. And you had to be careful. You couldn't tell. You couldn't uh, give them any kind of military information, mm -hmm. but they were sent from Germany, and they they did get home to my next of kin, you know, to my mother and father and sister. However, I never got any mail whatsoever delivered to me, and they sent packages and everything else when I was a POW. Never got a thing, huh. and all the time. Of course, the war was ending then, and anything that was sent into Germany, it just never arrived. Now, for what reason, I don't know. Yeah. But it, uh, it it was kind of demoralizing not to know what went on. Yes, for eight, yeah. eight long months, I had no idea what was happening back home. I was just hoping to God that they were faring a little bit better than I was in mm -hmm. the camp, you know. Mm -hmm. but, I'd like to take one of the, this down to make a copy of it sure. so you can have it in your folder. Absolutely. I, I made different uh, copies there. Oh, I made them some time ago, but you're welcome to take one of them. Well, you okay. one yeah. in your folder. Uh, so you have a picture of yeah. you in sure. the folder. That's okay. I'll put these with those. Uh, I have some uh, POW stuff here. Let me see. This this pink, pink one here I think you might be interested in. It was uh, about the only little bit of evidence I have from, from a German uh, oh. file. And, uh, okay, hold it just like that. This was a picture taken right after I was captured, you know, and uh, I guess I look like a Luff gangster. It's <laughs> funny, <laughs> so I mean, good reason to call us that. <clears throat> I guess I hadn't shaved in a, few, a couple of days, and, and uh, even though I was a young kid then, I had some sort of a beard. And this is some of the information they wrote down here, but that's all German stuff, and uh, in, or written in uh, German. But... Uh, I, I was surprised. Yeah. I was surprised after the war how much information they had about each one of us. That uh -huh. that major who was interrogated me, he wasn't lying when he told us that we know probably more about you than you know about yourself. Now, how did you get a hold of those German records? Uh, oh, after the war, I guess we got a hold of some of the stuff. And and okay. however, I got it. I I can't remember whoever got this for me, but somebody delivered it to me. Hmm. And. Uh, uh, but I guess uh, most of the guys that got back and they were fairly healthy, I was the unfortunate one that was hospitalized, and everything had to follow me some way or another. And that's why I have such few things from mm -hmm. Germany itself, you know. Because, uh, but uh, this, uh, this is one particular thing which I, I do like. You know? mm -hmm. Now what happened to that knife that uh, you trained? Oh, I don't know whatever for. happened to it since. I kept it for years and then finally lost it. And you kept but, it when uh, you reached home. You said it. But you have no idea. Oh, yeah. I got it on the road when I was marching from one camp to another. And they searched us. They gave us a thorough search mm -hmm. when we went into the final prison camp. I wanted to make sure. Well, I'm so and so and so my so God, if I was ever caught with that thing, I, they could have... I don't know, they, they probably wouldn't have shot me, but they could have given me a lot of solitary confinement. I think this is but, the item that you... Set. Oh, that's, that's right. This is the item here that uh, warned the Germans not to, uh, not to uh, move around the POWs. In other words, keep them. And here's, what, here's the, the signatures down here. Winston Churchill and Harry Truman, who we didn't know anything mm -hmm. about, you know. And then Joseph Stalin. <clears throat> okay. And here's some of the pictures my, my family kept some of the pictures of, of the fronts. They marked the fronts very accurately back in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't see that much in papers nowadays where, mm -hmm. the, where the front line is. But they kept accurate uh, ideas of where the front was then. And they were closing in on Germany. And these are clippings and papers and stuff like that. And this, this was a... Um, This was a letter written to me, and, and somehow or other, one I never received, but uh, it was sent to me, 
and it was addressed to me by, uh, I guess, one of my aunts somewhere in the States here. And, uh, but that, that's, this, these are the forms mm -hmm. uh, that they used for that kind of stuff, you know. Okay. And, uh, now, when did you meet your wife? Oh, this was uh, 19... Uh, After he was out of college and started to work at Brookhaven Lab. Yeah, where I worked. yeah, yeah. It was uh, quite quite a few years. I, I I moved back to New York here, and I moved out to Long Island, and she worked out there at Brookhaven Lab. You might we have heard. We were married of... in '59. Yeah. Okay. Now, let me see. We, I have some pictures here uh, from this. Uh, these are after the we were. Well, let's see, I see so, these are, this is a friend of mine who I was with out in the Army Hospital in Denver, Colorado. Uh, he, he was an infantry officer. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor. So he was still, I still keep in contact with him. And he's still alive. And, uh, but anyway, here's some of the pictures. I don't know if you can see these here. Of uh, uh, when we were liberated from the prison camp. You know, uh -huh. and some of the guys. Now these are some of the decorations the guy put on, a, on a, a, some sort of a home, homemade hat that he had. And this is how grimy we, we we looked. And this guy got a German hat, you know, that he's wearing. And uh, but this is a uh, this is how how we looked, I guess, when the war was over. You know, we were pretty grimy, believe me. Uh -huh. And uh, the only clothes we had were uh, stuff that came through the Red Cross. Uh, uh, old, uh, well, yeah, you, uh, uh, American uniforms, you know, mm -hmm. all uh, the GI stuff. But uh, you can see that uh, we're pretty shabby looking. And, uh, I don't know. Oh, here's a lot of letters. That we, uh, this, incidentally, was the, the parachute, the company that where I got the who were a member of the, par the Caterpillar Club, membership of the Caterpillar Club, it mentions here. And they, they sent the caterpillar pin along with that. My mother used to like to wear it. <laughs> I, I think they got the name caterpillar from because the caterpillar produced the silk, which was used in the parachutes. Uh -huh. I guess nowadays they use nylon or better, but uh, it was silk then. And uh, here's some pictures taken out at the when I was in the Army Hospital out in Denver, Colorado. Some of the friends I met out there. Okay. This man was a full colonel, and he was uh, yeah. the first colonel that was uh, that went in on the on the on the uh, uh, the China Road. Now, what did they call it? Yeah. China India Burma. Yeah, China Burma. India Burma. Yeah. Burma. Yeah. yeah, Lido Road, or uh, yeah. Yeah. They, Lido they went Road. into Kunming, and he had a very interesting to story to tell about. How they they pushed that road. It was it wound up the sides of mountains mm -hmm. and for miles and miles. They just go around and miles. And he drove the first uh, caravan of American trucks in mm -hmm. the Kunming. Mm -hmm. And uh, a very interesting story to tell. Yeah, there's only a couple okay. minutes left on this tape. So. Okay, well, all right then. We'll, yeah, let's we see. Have. We go. Yeah, this this is a a paper from from the group that I belong to. The, the name of the base that we were at in England was Polbrook. So I call this the Polbrook Post. And uh, this is... And then uh, when I was retired from the, uh, from the Air Force, they retired me for disability. And uh, uh, they, uh, they had the proceedings I had to go before a retiring board. Even though I, I was only in the, the service for less than, just quite a little less than four years, I, I still was retired. But I was retired for disability, so uh, that's why I'm retired. Otherwise, you, you, you normally you're retired for length of service. Uh -huh. In my case, it was disability. And here's these are nothing but uh, clippings of of the papers uh, of at the end of the war. There, my that my mother saved, and uh, this one here <coughs> shows uh, <coughs> they had a. a, 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 a survey at the end of the war 
about what would, what damage the Air Force did, and uh, apparently they uh, this. Uh, <coughs> They were showing the damage that was done by the bombings, and uh, there, there were over 500,000 killed, you know, in, in, during the war. And uh, the, Germany was completely leveled, uh, uh, as well, I guess, as Japan was, too. Mm -hmm. I never got to, I wanted, you know, believe me, I, I wanted to get to Japan. It was uh, the first thing on my mind when I enlisted in the Air Force was to bomb Japan. I, that's, that's how I felt the enemy was... Not Germany. Mm -hmm. I, 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 what, what were your feelings when you heard that we had dropped the atomic bombs on Japan? Oh, I was uh, I was glad about that. You know, it was, you know, you don't look back and you you don't you can't see the damage done to people. You just want to see the war over. Mm -hmm. You want to see as little damage done to ourselves, and you want to see the thing over as quickly as possible. The same as today. Okay. Two minutes. And, okay. So uh, that's that's the way I felt, uh -huh. and I felt at the time. If we had the weapon, why not use it? Uh -huh. <clears throat> Even today, I realized that it saved them maybe millions of American lives as well as tens of millions of Japanese lives uh -huh. by using the atom bomb, as terrible as it was. Uh -huh. I felt it was the right thing to do, even today. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, the, Germ the, the Japanese started the whole thing by their bombing Pearl Harbor. And uh, we unfortunately had ended using the atomic bomb. But well, that's wanted to thank you very much for your interview. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for being so interested in it. Yeah.